Ding, 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 ding. Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of The podcast in which a group of The podcast in which a group of Be sad. If they came out with a second movie, would you watch it? I would. If it was called Tide to Darkness? I would watch it because I'm a sucker for sword and sorcery type fantasy films. Uh, I'd go full on Exodus. I would just have, I would have like baby orc talking to a burning bush <laughs> and like baby orc and his brother who's far more articulate than he has to go to like the human pharaoh and be like, hey, let my orcs go. <laughs> I mean, that's that's basically what happens. Is that what happens? <laughs> that's more more or less. Uh, so baby baby Moses uh, ends up getting found by mm-hmm. humans uh, and raised. He gets the name Thrall because it means slave. Mm-hmm. Um, he then eventually he's like he's like their Moses. He eventually leads a revolt and frees. So this was this is the, the first war. So. Yeah, Warcraft one. There is then the second war. So he, when he gets older, ends up freeing all of the slaves, all the prisoners from the second war, and like taking them over to, like basically have your Americas. And he, well, actually, so this is all Europe, and then he takes them over to America, and then mm-hmm. goes and settles in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah, basically yeah. you're Moses. not far off from the. Yeah. What happens in yeah? What happens so? But it's a little more Mormon, right? Because they go to America. So there's a little twist on the old. <laughs> <laughs> twist. <laughs> but uh, what, so what happens in Warcraft Three? Is this demons, just demons? Isn't well, it's just just one? England well, so, going over and colonizing. So Warcraft Three was, um, yeah, the demons come in. So yeah. that was that was a main problem with the movie. Was you know a lot more in going into this so this is like i don't even know what to compare it to what's a good comparison but it was almost like if you are a harry potter fan it would be like if they made the first movie and it had direct ties from things that happened in the seventh book Mm -hmm. like there's things that you don't know like when you read the series and at the end the series does i think a good job of tying things together so like some of the items that are key components later in the books in book six and seven, you first see in books one and two, but you don't know that they're that important at that time. Kind of the same thing here. There's there's aspects like the whole demon aspect and the whole yep. possession thing doesn't come into play. Like when you play Warcraft one, first of all, there is no like there's basically no lore. Like it's just like you're playing. Yeah. It'd be like, imagine if somebody made a movie about solitaire. Like, hey, there's, there's lore, <laughs> but like, they are solitaire. making a movie about Tetris. So. Mm-hmm. They are. And that <laughs> but like, so solitaire two and solitaire three come out. And by solitaire three, each King has their own backstory. Each like they have, they have kingdoms. They have this whole thing, but then someone decided, you know what, instead of doing solitaire three, we're going to go back and do solitaire one that nobody knows that no one understands that no one knows was a thing. And then, that's their launching of the franchise. Like, that's, franchise. Re- that's really yeah. what made me think about Star hmm. Wars. Why George Lucas started in the I know I talked about it in the episode. He thought that was a more compelling story and he didn't follow the linear path. Right. Right. Hmm. I mean, it's be like if you wanted to make a book about the Bible and you were like, do you know what? Our first movie is just going to be Genesis. Nothing else. We're not going to do anything else. It's just going to be like Genesis. And that's the whole movie. And it's like, all right, but that's not what people know. That's not the story everybody relates to and can kind of connect to it's kind of boring. Yeah. If you're going to do something for old Testament, you got to do the wrathful God in there somewhere, you know? Right. That's what people <laughs> want to see. And then you can yeah. go back and you can make your Hobbit movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same thing. Even, even with Lord of the Rings, because we kept referencing that, like it's they, it'd be like if he made the Hobbit movies before he made the Lord of the Rings movies. It's like, all right, there's a story there, but it wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have gotten the hype that you had. Yeah, it wasn't as compelling. The trilogy, if you'd started with the Hobbit. Okay, I I I got you. Yeah, um, that we're kind of going back. If we had just Thrall, the story of Thrall, it would have been much better. I think that would have been if you basically took this entire movie and condensed it into like 20 minutes and made it like Thrall's introduction. Like basically it was like, Hey, here's how Thrall was born. 
and then came it's through like the gate 20, in the 25 basket. years later we have yeah. a we have a continent that's at war because the orcs are there the humans are there they're constantly fighting and then we follow the story of thrall i think that's where you would have had a solid movie mm-hmm. as opposed to focusing on the entire backstory the entire time because anybody that played anybody that plays wow or yeah. two or three doesn't know anything that happened in that movie it's like cliff notes Mm-hmm. It's true. It's true. But it are the is like the fell demon guy in in part of this world. He's in it, but again, you don't know the full backstory of of what happened. You know mm-hmm. that the portal was open, that they came over, but like the the demons and everything that happens from that capacity. It's probably like, like one page stages. of the the instruction manual. Oh, okay. In, in, in so tides they're really of darkness. Buffing it. So the the whole Ben Foster good witch bad witch i don't know what i am is just entirely made up for well that character does exist in wow and it and it does happen Indeed. that way i don't know why i forgot his name but yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it, and it does happen that way but it's not as explained that early on like you kind of know like hey this dude's kind of doing some crazy shit. he opened up a portal because that's mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm remembering my lore correctly, he's the other side of it. Like it's basically the portal's a doorway that needs mm-hmm. both sides to open it. Yep, so he invited had, them in. Right. So Gul'dan's on the one side, and then possessed Medivh is like over here because yep. he mm-hmm. read a book and was like, "I can handle all this dark stuff." And it's like, "Nope, you got nope, corrupted." It handles you. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. And so, yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't like a straight possession. It was more of a he dabbled in the dark. He arts. was. He was the guardian. He's supposed to guard the dark arts. He decided to read the dark arts, and the dark arts corrupted him instead, mm-hmm. and made him his pup, made him their puppet. But you don't know who the puppet master is until much, much later. The Burning Legion. And so Medid is introduced in the first World of Warcraft. No, but you got to realize the first, well, first World Warcraft. of Warcraft, like, it was like, hey, this is a cool game where orcs are going to fight humans. Like yeah, right. like there was no okay. rich backstory. I think but, most right. of this backstory came literally in the first page of the instruction manual of sure. Tides of Darkness is right. the only time you get any kind of initial backstory. I right. remember it, like in the and, CD-ROM. And, <laughs> and, and would you see Medivh in which game do you first actually see? Oh no, World Medivh of Warcraft, is... right? <laughs> I, don't even... I, I think I think you do see him in, in one. Three? I think oh, you really? see him in one, but like it's again, it's like you said, he's like you get like the cinematic uh, opening and then you get the instruction booklet with the CD that kind of is like, hey, here's the humans. Here's the orcs. This is what happened. Now just go kill each other. Like it, it's like giving you a chessboard and someone gave you like a, a leaflet on the story of the, the, the white team. The versus the black. <laughs> right, like this is this is why the they're rook. at war. But yeah. like you don't really care. This is how uh. the pieces move and this is how you play the game. I actually went back and watched a bunch of the cinematics from the original mm-hmm. games. Warcraft 1, in between every level, they have a screen with two people talking to each other. It could have been Medivh, it could have been the king. Like There was actually a lot more story in those games than we would have thought for 1994. Like Blizzard was, I think, way ahead of the game for that. Well, I think 2 was the one where... Well, it might have started in 1, where each campaign mission like you were actually doing something that progressed the story yes. but it just it wasn't something that you were actively paying attention to right right to that level like you were hey let me like you can it's cool like cinematics are cool like you said about the cinematics from warcraft 3 same thing with the cinematics of, of world of warcraft go watch the go watch the launch trailers of some of the They're later cool. The yeah. later campaigns like Legion, go watch the launch trailer for Legion. It's like this is like a like yeah, make a movie. Like that's what they should have done. The mm. team that made the cinematics for WoW should have made the movie, and we would have mm-hmm. been fine. But they just killed it. I mean, they probably could have made an interesting franchise, but it's just and and we didn't even get into it. Again, we probably talked for another hour on this thing. But the plot line about the half or killing the king and all that. I mean. And then all of a sudden she's welcomed back in Gul'dan. Nothing happens to him, even though there's this big battle where we don't like Gul'dan anymore. But like, okay, he's fine. He can stay. <laughs> like, th- th- that's where it all unraveled. I mean, right there on that whole battlefield setup. I'm not saying there's other elements that weren't perfect, but that whole thing. There were no, you know, comeuppance for Gul'dan. She got welcomed back, killed the king. And of course, we have a miscommunication on, you know, her intent. Right, she yeah, I remember that she gets welcomed back into the 
clan, right? Into but the, supposedly whatever. that's supposed to help them become at peace when really the people now who she was friendly with think she's the one who just killed the king. So, mm. and- It doesn't like, make a lick of sense, yeah. Yeah, like the, the, the big baddie doesn't have any repercussion, the Gul'dan. That's where, honestly, in, in that battlefield, I think is where the movie really fell flat on its face. Just that- well, and it's like it's like you events. said because they were trying to build the franchise instead yep. of tell of telling a story that had a beginning, middle, and end. Yep. It had a beginning, a middle, a middle, and a middle. Like that's yep. that's all we got. And then okay, cool, we'll continue this next time. And it's like oh, but there we're not going to no have it next time, time. <laughs> unless yeah. it's only China. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also not that. In- I'm sorry, I felt like from I got from the lore I got from the movie wasn't that interesting. Like they, the, because the you just said it's the precursor. It, it's yeah. the background information. It's True. not the the core story. It's not all that interesting at the end of the day. Like mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure they. I know they have books and stuff out there, and people do read it. But it's like cool. I don't also read the Halo books because <laughs> it's it's a video game. Like mm-hmm. it's not meant to be a story. Like if I want to read a story, I'll go read a story. It's mm-hmm. cool that there's tie-ins to it like in that they have connecting pieces but it's it was weird that they built it that they made a movie that i guess they were catering to the fans but only catering to like the hardcore definitely that knew the whole thing as opposed to the general populace Mm. as well they did the fan service thing so i don't know if you saw it yet or you plan on seeing it but we just did like a a rush episode for D D, the new one that came out Okay. And there are some definitely deep cuts in there if you're an enfranchised D&D, but they also kept things light enough that if you were just familiar with it, you'd have the feel. I right. think Warcraft tried to do that. I'm actually really glad we saw these movies back to back because they tried to do a lot of that, but failed. So like, for example, and Tom, you probably didn't catch this, this one go- scene where the guy turns the guard into a sheep. I mean, that's a big Warcraft thing. Like the, the the wizards can turn people. There's a spell. It was D and D, right? No, I'm actually talking about Warcraft. That it, they turned a guard into a sheep so that they could let Lothar go. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, Cat right. Guard. So that's like from way back in the game. It was like, haha, I'm gonna turn that guy into a sheep. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that's that's a deep. But whereas like you might not have got that if you didn't play Warcraft. Whereas yeah. they did stuff like that in the D and D movie that even if it was fan service, I think a more general audience would enjoy it. Like that was just mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, great. It turned into a sheep. But I think we would have gotten something out of that more than the average person. Or maybe you guys say, hey, that wasn't funny at all. But you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there was more details there for the enfranchised Warcraft fan. And that's that's what I think. I mean, like they, the Marvel, I think, I guess has set like the bar for that. They, I think they do a solid job of, making movies that cater to the people that watch the movies but also giving nods to the comics but also being different from the comics so that you're not going in and knowing what you're already going to watch whereas this was like oh hey we're going to make a movie that hopefully the general population understands but all those nods that we do a lot of them are going to be focused to like this super one percent group that Mm -hmm. absolutely loves the game what D &D did is the movie they had a ton of nods to D&D, but they covered the gap with the normal person through just comedy bit after comedy bit, comedy bit, comedy bit. Like they just did a lot of that. So they were trying to use humor to relate to the average person who may not be as big into D&D. And that was one of the criticisms that Tom and I shared. I don't know, KJ, if you were in that camp or not, so I don't want to speak for you. But some of it was funny and some of it was just like too repetitive. Like you're getting, you're trying to get too many jokes in per minute that it got tiresome, but there were some really good ones too. So that's how they tried to bridge that gap to get mm-hmm. the mass audience was through comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with you, Nick. It was just kind of, you know, there's a joke, there's an ironic comment coming after every <laughs> single thing that happens. Um, though I will say, I prefer that to, this movie by far no it's true no <laughs> D, like yeah it actually made I, me I would appreciate much, yeah the, the D D movie more mm-hmm. i so much tom prefer was, it not take Luke itself Luke. seriously yeah yeah, yeah. tom mm-hmm. I, again 
I, I don't want to speak for Tom, but he was lukewarm on D&D. KJ, I was probably more lukewarm than the rest of you on D&D. I think yeah. you were closer to me, Nick. But Yeah, um, I, I enjoyed it, though. I, the reason I know I enjoyed it was because I actually want to see it again to see kind of some things I missed or I, you know, wasn't gra- get grasping. Mm-hmm. But do I think it's an amazing movie? No, but it, Sword and Sorcery, the bar is pretty low. I mean, you got the Lord of the Rings trilogy and then Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. it's it's harder to get a solid Sword and Sorcery film that doesn't take itself too seriously either. You know? Yeah, I wonder why that is. Why they're so hard to to do i guess it's just there's such i guess they're relying on complete worlds and it's just easier to do in fiction you could just write it um i mean dune has a little bit of that problem too i mean dune i guess is science fiction but dune also has a very sort of fantasy like concept going on in the sense of definitely there's these myths there's uh there's this kind of religion that you have to understand there's these different races that Dune is still more fantasy. So, so like Star Wars is fantasy in a space setting. I don't think Dune is that technical when it comes to like sci-fi elements. No. So I actually think Dune is more of a fantasy. It it takes place in a sci-fi setting, but I think it actually would be more in the fantasy camp. I yeah. Mean, in general. Yeah, I, I think star yeah. trek is more sci-fi i yeah i guess so i mean it's sometimes the differences are really hard to parse between the two um just because dune and star wars both do feel more like fantasy especially dune feels so like with the magic I, I think, worm KJ, stuff where, where's your yeah thoughts in here dune so in my head fantasy challenges you emotionally Ugh. sci-fi challenges you intellectually and i think dune challenges you way more intellectually than emotionally in other words star wars you're excited to be in the trench and is he going to blow up the death star star trek you're excited when spock figures out the puzzle and then solves a day and dune is more about the politics it's there's there wasn't a lot of emotion in it right in fact the whole goal of what's his name was to have no reaction it's not a clear cut for me like the the burning it's not clear cut i'm just trying to i don't know yeah I i actually don't know where i stand on that I don't, yeah, I'm not entirely sure if I... Sci-fi, so for example, pure example of sci-fi, um, well, actually, there's fantasy elements there, too. I was going to say The Expanse. Do you, any of you watch The Expanse? No, I haven't seen it, but I think Doug loves that. That, yeah, the, but what I mean by that is they actually try to take space seriously. Like, their ships move like it should be in space. There's effect of gravity. Like, they really take space seriously <laughs> i look i look at yeah. the difference of could i see this happening in 500 years thousand years whatever that's why to me star trek is science fiction whereas star wars is science fantasy because yeah. it the like the force element like the magic element if it's something that like hey in 200 300 500 years i could see this actually taking place because there is a a system that's been developed and this is how it worked that that's why i like the expanse because it focuses more on you know what this actually could be where we're at in in a thousand years or 500 years like like even the opening scene the opening sequence where it's like you watch the water levels rise on earth like it's like oh yeah this actually could happen very quickly also if you guys haven't seen it like the people who never who weren't born on earth can't handle earth's gravity it's like torture you know like there's there's things that are interesting in that now that's why i'm like doom throws me for a loop because you do have there is a fantastical element there uh with the spice and there there is some so that's why i'm like torn i don't it's both you know it's not as pure as star wars for sure yeah i i mean i feel it's it's interesting i don't know yeah because i if you're gonna say challenges you intellectually, what the, the impression I get there is there's there's sort of geopolitical questions that are that or more more philosophical questions that are put up. Is that what you mean? Mm, in, in a more traditional sci-fi, it's you need to either understand the science oh, or be excited by goodness. trying. Does okay. Dune do that? So I don't think so. What I think Dune is trying to do, especially no, I'm asking Easter KJ book, actually. Oh, you're saying because like, he's a Ben like, or whatever. I think it's it more the mystical, no? 
Benny Jesuit. Yeah, yeah, Benny Jesuit, and mm. also but the, like they explain the, how the, the spice work. and like they the clarity with the, the spice. Well, no, I guess the spice is kind of fantastical, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's more mystical. That's what I'm saying. And yeah, yeah also his I the guess suits the Benny I'll Jesuit. give you the 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 sweat suits or whatever the heck they're called. <laughs> and the the mysticalness of the Benny Jesuit is supposed to be a sort of a eugenic oh, yeah. program. That's why I have a little bit eugenic program eugenics like they're they're shaping his genes to so make the, like uh, selection like, it's like yeah. explainable and you have you have to understand what genes are but there's no emotion there you're not yeah. excited that they're going to get the but best genes no but there is a fantastical element this but, is no dude, this is I, like, then one. what is a hard magic book right isn't a part of hard magic being explaining the details of the magic and being excited or contained by the the game system, the magic. Hmm, mm. that's true. That's true. Which then mm. could potentially challenge you intellectually. Right? Yeah. you're like, oh, I, I mean, I, you I was, was... going to do this with that magic because I understand yeah. the rules so well. That was why I went more. Sorry, with Dune because they have those more mystical, magical elements tied in. Although I was reading the books. Actually, I stopped in the second one, and you're going to laugh at me when I tell you this. All of a sudden, I found out, and this did everyone read or no? I've read the first it? five books. So. Okay. Pat, I don't know if you're there. So, do you mind if I throw this spoil? Okay. <laughs> There's a line where you, it, it clearly identifies that our world and our history was history. Like they reference like Hitler or something. They reference, and yeah. Like, and all of a sudden, it like, it kind of took me out of it. I don't know why. Like, it's, it, well, it took me out of it. It's that pretty important. Yeah, I. I so it, this is, I don't. It did. It, it just I took actually me out think of the whole thing. that that particular line kind of speaks to the point I was going to make to, to yeah. KJ, which was sure. this idea of this intellectual challenge. I initially thought of it not as how does the science fiction work, therefore I'm contained by the rules of the science fiction, and and that's that's the fun of it is the game as opposed to the, the emotion, but more of like the science fiction affords sort of intellectual challenges in a way that fantasy doesn't. And one of them in Dune would be the nature of leadership. And so what, what happens is after Paul takes power at the end of Dune, in the second book, Ch Children of Dune? Yeah. What's the second book again, Nick? Is it Children? Children, of Children. I didn't is get it past Children it. of Dune, okay. I didn't get um, past it. What happens is it's years later and after, yeah, and there's a, there was a war. And um, what happens is they kill something like 100 billion people in this war for Paul to take over the galaxy. And he's talking to, I think, Duncan. And they're like, well, let's look at the past. Well, who are the great leaders of the past? And like Hitler. Well, how many people did Hitler kill? Oh, like, like, eight, like eight to 20 million. And he's like, well, that sounds pathetic. This Hitler doesn't sound very good at all. He's not a very good leader like you, Paul. And so there's this kind of intellectual question of, oh, these people we are kind of set to admire by these patterns of um, of hero worship and greatness, be they contained in history or religion, actually very often they're, they're kind of reveal a very evil person or something very destructive. Well, and that's why I was saying uh, another reason sci-fi challenges you intellectually is that sometimes social commentary on something that's going on today. And that's that's an intellectual thing, not... Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep, perfect. That, that's what I meant, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It's it's a or a philosophical question, yeah. I think your uh, initial question, um, why there aren't any more fantasy sword mm. fantasy ones, yeah. I personally feel that Lord of the Rings not only kind of set the bar so unobtainably high, um, but also at the end of the day, they're all kind of the same story that already was told by Lord of the Rings. So I think most people shy away from that because it's not only would they be doing something that would be compared to Lord of the Rings innately because of the genre, but also because the story would probably line up in some capacity. And I think anyone that has ever attempted to, as you can see from that list, <laughs> tried to follow the Lord of the Rings franchise process and put the cart before the horse, just mm -hmm. like with Warcraft, and started way too early and didn't give the audience what they were looking for and they didn't get a continuation. You know, it's funny you were saying this. I at the same time I started looking up 
to see when Game of Thrones aired. And that was from 2011 to 2019. So I was also wondering if it went to a safer medium to experience those kind of things maybe. versus the big screen. Yeah, maybe television is That's better. why I was wondering if there is something there. It's mm. just like Pat saying, it's too much of a risk. Or, well, the, the Am Amazon yeah. series, right? The new Lord of the Rings Amazon series, I'm told, is palatable at least <laughs> depends i I'm, i think a lot of people like it more than i do um i find a lot of recent sword and sorcery fantasy to be ya drivel i mean it's it's catering to not the pure fantasy fans they're trying to get the younger folks involved mm -hmm. and I, that's just my opinion yeah I ya has with, advanced a lot I, i've seen it with the, the a lot of people like the lord of the rings uh, show on amazon there was another one they did with willow which was the same i felt like it could have been on the wb you know like uh 11 like it just mm. again maybe there's an audience maybe i'm not that audience but again i'm going to try to find things that sword and sorcery and give them a shot yeah and there's some like i think stardust and neil gaiman it might have been a book but it certainly turned into a movie I, I think that was actually palatable it's a smaller thing it has much more of a fairy tale element as opposed mm. to this sort of fantasy idea of a parallel world which has these kind of rules in this history um but yeah i, I mean i to pat's point too i think most genres are pretty repetitive like how different is one action movie from another i think the difference though is fantasy requires such a purchase into that world in order to understand the stuff that goes on there as opposed to any kind of action movie where it's like well we're in the world and this this guy's really good with guns you don't you need know this backstory. guy yeah. yeah you don't need his backstory maybe his like his wife died or something and so now he's sad but still good with well, guns because it was an assassin the back, who took out the his backstory wife and yeah. the backstory is the world like they're all set in our world so we already know the backstory so exactly oh, that's a good to, point you don't need to do the politics you don't need to do the countries you don't need to do the races it's the world and it's like okay cool that's out of the way what happened to our character whereas yeah. like something like warcraft it's like hey let's take this entire chunk and dedicate mm -hmm. it to explaining the world that you live in also yeah, stardust we... was fantastic stardust yeah stardust is fantastic it's a movie it is yeah. a movie yeah it's uh we have robert de niro playing uh, <laughs> wow. a gay pirate and it's hilarious. That's, that's the only that's the only tagline you need for this movie. Yeah. <laughs> this, like you need to 2007. watch it. Yeah. I, I like, it wasn't even on my radar. He's a he's a drag queen pirate captain. And there's this, you know, one scene where he gets caught and um and like his his crew's like, oh, we don't care, it's cool. And he's like, Arr, arr. <laughs> and it's really really funny um interesting yeah it's it's good actually i find claire danes kind of annoying in it but other than that it's a pretty solid film yeah claire danes charlie cox who is uh daredevil daredevil who's pretty henry, good in this henry cavill mm -hmm. um ben barnes who was in something else recently i think he might have been game of thrones michelle pfeiffer and uh robert de niro so mm -hmm. I had the same exact reaction, Nick, when because uh, mm. Laura, my wife, told me about it uh, like a couple of years, uh, like I think when we first started dating. She's like Stardust, and I'm like, never heard of it. I think it was like ten years old at that point. She's like, how have yeah. you never heard of this? And I looked at him like, how have I not heard of this? Like, yeah. this is mm. this is a crazy cast. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so, it's quite worth it. Definitely Neil, worth a watch. Yeah, Neil Gaiman's pretty talented. I haven't seen um, Gods of America, but. It's a very uh, similar feel to Princess Bride. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually exactly. like it more than Princess Bride. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. The, I saw Princess Bride like way later in life. I didn't grow up with it, so I don't have the same attachment everyone else says. I was like, okay. But like some people like, really love Princess Bride, so I'm in the minority there. I don't hate it. It's just, you know, it's inconceivable. Oh, we have to, there is, if we're going to ever do adaptations again, there is a Wallace Shawn adaptation that I'm going to make you guys watch. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And it's a brilliant movie. It's, it makes me, it kills me every time I see it. And you guys are going to hate every minute of it. Do they just sit around in a dinner party and talk about More stuff? or less, yes. <laughs> you love those movies. Oh God, it's so good, you guys. You love those watch... movies when nothing happens except you see a lot happening that no one yeah. else sees. We're going to see, we're going to watch Vanya on 42nd Street with Wallace Shawn from Princess Bride. 
inconceivable. <laughs> okay, well, Pat, it was good seeing you, man. You too. Thanks yeah, it was good seeing you. Yeah, thanks for coming back on. Hope you come back again soon. Yeah. I'll come back on when you do Stardust. There, oh, there you go. that would be fun. It, it actually would, would be actually. a lot of fun. I would, I would do the questions for that. <laughs>